I love, love, love working in a university context. It's, it's where I started my ministry work, and it's what I feel I've been called to and, and, and certainly drawn to. There, there's so many uh, advantages of working in a university environment. Tops for me is access to students. It's just something about this time in their lives when they're asking good questions and experiencing new things. And if they are connected to strong spiritual mentorship with healthy people, the potential for their growth is unlimited. There's so many advantages to working in a university environment. Think about it. How did Jesus grow the next generation of believers? By creating an intimate learning community where they not only learned together, but lived amongst each other and ate meals together and served with one another, where there was a growing sense of love amongst them. Why? Because embedded in the learning and living and eating and serving and loving were all the kingdom values to be passed on to the next generation. And we have that here by the very makeup of being in a university environment. We also have a wealth of mental capacity and capital with faculty, staff, and families. We are all in some way connected to or associated with this enterprise of knowing and knowledge. And while there are a number of advantages, there are also some disadvantages, especially as it relates to this enterprise of knowledge and knowing. As the old adage goes, uh, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And to academics, and even those associated with academics, if we're not careful, everything looks and seems like something that can be mastered if we know enough. Now, I realize I'm heading into a danger zone, but I'd ask that you journey with me quickly through some rocky terrain here because there is an enormous blessing on the other side. Because when it comes to our spiritual healing and wholeness, there are limits to knowledge and knowing. Remember what we're attempting to do here. We as a faith community are going on this exploration of being made whole. With the idea being if we focus our attention as well as intention on healing and wholeness, we can turn our eyes away from the disease and turn our eyes towards the healer of our disease that we can counterbalance all this information that we're taking in about sickness and viral spread and death rates by taking in some images of healing and wellness. That we spend this summer making some healing choices for ourselves. And lastly, prepare ourselves to minister to a group of incoming students who will need support in their healing and wholeness upon their arrival. And as we approach this narrative of Jesus healing his friend Lazarus, we find Jesus attempting to move us beyond mere knowledge and knowing to something even richer. And it's all captured in this family drama. It's funny, I was on a, a Zoom call with some of my student affairs colleagues and we got to talking about traveling to visit family and someone associated a family visit with doing time <laughs> because so often family is associated with drama. But John uses the family drama about healing a brother to critique our reliance on knowledge and knowing and how moving beyond mere knowing can lead to a profound sense of healing and wholeness. But because everybody in the text is so much in the know. Mary and Martha are in the know. They, they know a great deal about Jesus. Their brother Lazarus is, is sick and they happen to relationally know a healer. Not only this, but they know where Jesus is to such a degree, they can get word to him about their brother's illness. Jesus finds out and lets his closest followers, the 12, the apostles, know Lazarus is deathly ill and there is an urgency about the situation. But instead of running to Lazarus' side, Jesus waits. Verse 6 uh, of John chapter 11 informs us, when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Jesus waits to expand their capacity to trust. Jesus does this for the 12. He does this for Mary and Martha. And Jesus does this for us today. 
Trust is such an essential component to divine intimacy and compassion. Jesus will go to great lengths in his waiting to expand our capacity to trust. Jesus does it here when the 12 are in the boat in the midst of the storm with Abraham during his uh, the sacrifice of Isaac, doing Egyptian bondage during Babylonian exile. And how many times has this happened in your life where Jesus has applied the gift of waiting to intercede in order to expand your capacity to trust? But how often would we rather rely on our knowing in order to avoid the pesky necessity of trusting. This is certainly true with so many people in this unfolding event, because here comes Martha, and she knows Jesus was two miles away from town. In the text, we find Jesus does not go all the way into Bethany, but stays a distance away. But Martha knows, and Martha comes. Martha knows in in verses 21 through 24, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But notice Jesus's response in verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? (laughs) Isn't that that rich? Isn't that that fascinating? Martha is talking about what she knows, but Jesus is asking her what she believes, what she trusts. She knows in past tense, if Jesus would have been at their side, there would have been a healing. And she also knows in the future tense that there will be a resurrection. But Jesus is asking her and asking us this, do you believe I am present tense resurrection, that I am currently life? This is the radical recognition Jesus is inviting us into. Jesus is not saying I can offer resurrection or I can offer life. If that was the case, that would be radical in itself. But there is something even more amazing. Jesus' claim invites us to put not our knowing, but our trusting in this. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is saying I'm currently the substance and makeup and meaning of dying things being brought back to life. Do you Believe this. In the face of Martha's knowing and Mary's knowing and the onlookers knowing, Jesus is so much interested in what they know, but what they believe. Where does humanity place their trust? See, immersed in this family drama is this internal debate about knowing and believing. Because knowing is a far cry from trusting, believing, and faithing. Just like the distance between Bethany and and Jesus in our text, knowing is a distance from faithing. A small distance, but a distance to be traveled nonetheless. Remember our definition of faith in Hebrews 11 and 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things known. No, no, not at all. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, let me tell you what I'm not saying. I'm not saying there isn't a place for knowledge and knowing, especially when it comes to our spiritual growth and formation. I would compel us all to dive into the study of God's word in order to know what it says in that time and ours. I was I would compel us all to carry out the due diligence that we need in knowing the context as well as the theological import of all that we read in the Bible. There is an important role knowledge and knowing has in our spiritual growth and formation as the people of God. But if we aren't careful, solely relying on our knowledge and knowing can lead to an unhealthy sense of control and an addiction to certainty and a diminishing of your perception of the size of your God in your world. 
Here's the thing. Knowledge has never been the aim of God's work in the world. Knowledge's role is to ultimately lead us to a profound sense of trust because the aim is deep intimacy with God, God's creation, and one another, which demands a robust capacity to trust. So much so, Jesus does something amazing to address the role of trust in this process of healing and wholeness. Jesus goes to a grave and cries out the name Lazarus, a name whose root origin means, get this, Lazarus's root origin means God helps. Did you know that? And when the name of the source of healing and wholeness is spoken, a dead man dressed in death wrapping rises. And Jesus commands to the astonishing crowd and to us is this, loose him and let him go. Take away all the death wrappings and rags. Loose him and let him go. Take away all those reminders of your former stagnation condition. Loose him and let him go because Jesus gets the final word in the presence of death. Loose him and let him go. Loose him and let him go. Because with Jesus, cemeteries can become delivery rooms for new life. Do you believe this? So what might be a healing choice for you today? Allowing God to use waiting to expand your capacity to trust? Maybe it's to arrest your need of of unhealthy control and certainty. Maybe it is to alleviate some stumbling of of embracing uh, by, by, by embracing the light of Christ in you. Could it be to allow what you know to lead you to a deeper trust in God? Or maybe it's time to be loosed and let go of what once tied you to dead dreams dead relationships, or a death-dealing attitude. The remainder of our service, whether it's communion, prayer, or upcoming announcements, all of it will invite us into a deeper sense of trust. May the God who helps guide us as a community in this loving act of faithing. Amen? Amen.